Governor Macklem for his opening remarks. Well, thank you, Paul, and good morning. I'm very pleased to be here with Senior Deputy Governor Carolyn Rogers to discuss today's policy decision. This is the first time we're speaking to you on the day of a policy decision that is not accompanied by a monetary policy report, so it is a little different from what we're all used to. We want households, businesses, and communities to understand the actions we're taking and why. So we're answering questions at every decision as part of our com commitment to keep Canadians fully informed. Our quarterly NPRs include a full economic outlook. Our deliberations this time were based on how the economy and risks to the outlook have evolved, have evolved compared to what we expected in January. In the six weeks since our January decision, there have been no big surprises. Economic growth has remained weak and inflation has eased further as higher interest rates restrain demand and relieve price pressures. But with inflation still close to 3% and underlying inflationary pressures persisting, the assessment of the Governing Council is that we need to give higher interest rates more time to do their work. With that in mind, the Governing Council decided to maintain the policy interest rate at 5%. We're also continuing our policy of quantitative tightening. In January, we indicated that our confidence had increased, that our policy rate was high enough to restore price stability. And while we could not rule out the need to raise rates further if there were new inflation surprises, we indicated that our discussions were shifting from whether our policy rate is restrictive enough to how long it needs to stay at the current level. Today's decision reflects the Governing Council's assessment that a policy rate of 5% remains appropriate. It's still too early to consider lowering the policy interest rate. Recent inflation data suggests monetary policy is working largely as expected, but future progress on inflation is expected to be gradual and uneven and upside risks to inflation remain. Governing Council needs to see further and sustained easing in core inflation. Depuis notre décision de janvier, il n'y a pas eu de grande surprise. La croissance est restée faible et l'inflation a encore diminué parce que les taux d'intérêt plus élevés ont limité la demande et allégé price pressures. pressures persist. This is why the Governing Council believes that higher rates should be given more time to take effect. The Governing Council has therefore decided to maintain its policy rate at 5%, and the bank is continuing with its policy of quantitative tightening. In January, we said we were more confident that the policy rate was high enough to restore price stability. We couldn't rule out further rate hikes if inflation picked up unexpectedly, but we said our discussions were shifting focus. The question was no longer so much whether the policy rate was restrictive enough to restore price stability. It was more a question of how long to keep it at its current level. Today's decision was taken because the Governing Council believes that a policy rate of 5% is still appropriate. It is still too early to think about lowering it. According to recent data, monetary policy is essentially working as expected, but inflation is expected to rise gradually and unevenly and there are still upside risks. The Governing Council wants to see core inflation continue to fall on a sustainable basis. Before taking your questions, let me take let me... a moment to discuss how the economy is evolving. Global growth has slowed and inflationary pressures have continued to ease. The US economy also slowed, but has remained surprisingly strong even as inflation has continued to decline. In Canada, 
Economic growth has come in somewhat stronger than projected in the January NPR. Pace remains weak and below potential. Growth in the second half of 2023 was close to zero, allowing supply to catch up with demand. Labor markets have continued to ease gradually. With employment growing more slowly than population, the labor market has come into better balance. Job vacancies have returned to more normal levels and the pace of hiring has been modest. Wage growth has been in the four to 5% range for some time now, but there are now signs that wage pressures may be easing. CPI inflation eased to 2.9% in January. This largely reflected lower energy prices and easing in food price inflation, as well as weakness in semi-durable prices like footwear and clothing. But shelter price inflation remains elevated and is still the biggest contributor to overall inflation. More broadly, underlying price pressures persist. Our preferred measures of core inflation eased in January, but remain above 3% on a year-over-year -year and a three-month basis. As well, the share of CPI components rising faster than 3% declined, but is still above the historical average. Looking ahead, we continue to expect inflation to be close to 3% through the middle of this year before easing in the second half. Gasoline prices are expected to continue to add volatility to inflation in coming months, and shelter, prices, shelter price pressures are likely to persist. In other words, the path back to the 2% target will be slow, and progress is likely to be uneven. Governing Council also discussed the risks to the economy and inflation. Risks to, the global, risks to global energy prices and transportation costs related to conflicts remain elevated. Domestically, inflation could prove more persistent than expected. We don't want to keep monetary policy this restrictive for longer than we have to, but nor do we want to jeopardize the progress we made in bringing inflation down. Governing Council remains concerned about the persistence of underlying inflation, and we want to see further deceleration in core inflation in the coming months. We remain focused on the indicators of inflationary pressures that we've mentioned before. Demand pressures have eased, and the economy now looks to be in modest excess supply. With the labor market coming into better balance, we are looking for further evidence that wage growth is moderating. Before our April decision, we'll also get new information on corporate pricing behavior and inflation expectations. We'll be looking for the frequency and size of price increases to continue to normalize and for short-term inflation expectations to ease further. We've come a long way in our fight against inflation. Monetary policy is working, inflation is coming down. But it's too early to loosen the restrictive stance of policy that has gotten us this far. Low, stable inflation is a cornerstone of shared prosperity, and we remain resolute in our commitment to restore price stability. And with that summary, Senior Deputy Governor and I would be pleased to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Governor. Um, let me quickly remind everyone of the procedures here. We've got um, close to a dozen reporters here in Ottawa at the bank, as well as a few on the line. I'm going to start here in the room. Uh, we'll ask everyone to please limit yourself to one question to make sure we can get to every outlet. Uh, if I forget to do so, please state your name and affiliation. Avant de poser une question, veuillez vous identifier et si je ne l'ai pas fait, et comme d'habitude, libre à vous de poser vos questions dans la langue officielle. You may ask your question in the official language. Ottawa. I'm going to call in Mackenzie Gray of Global News. Please go ahead. Uh, I didn't think I was going to go first. So I'm going to go a little off topic here relative to what I think my colleagues will be asking. But um, both in the States, Janet Yellen and uh, uh, Jay Powell have both talked about commercial real estate being a potential issue. Uh, Jay Powell said it's a manageable problem, but he's worried about some banks uh, having issues there. Uh, in the Canadian context, how concerned are you about that being an issue uh, for the economy going forward? Uh, we've... Uh, we work with our other federal partners that uh, that monitor the the financial conditions in Canada, so OSFI in particular. So um, we've definitely got our eye on commercial real estate. the The market in Canada is not uh, is not the same as in the U.S. A lot of the commercial real estate is held by uh, sort of mid tier banks. 
Um, in Canada, the, the exposure to commercial real estate spread more broadly. We also haven't seen some of the sort of reset and valuations that we've seen. So um, it's definitely something we're watching closely. Um, we've got our financial stability report coming out in early May, and uh, we've started the work on that now. And this is, a, this is definitely an area we're taking a, a deep look into, so you can expect to hear more from us. Okay, let's uh, stay down here with uh, Najud Amelie from Canadian Press, please. Hi, Governor. Uh, I'm wondering how much shelter price inflation is playing a role in your decision to continue holding uh, your policy rate. Um, Najud, look, housing is a big part of the economy. Uh, it's certainly something that Canadians are very focused on. And so, yes, shelter price inflation, uh, it is it's the biggest contributor to inflation right now. It's certainly uh, weighing on our decisions. Having said that, um, our, our target is for total CPI inflation. And if you look beyond shelter, uh, we are seeing that underlying inflationary pressures persist. And one way to look at that is, if you, if you look at our measures, of, our preferred measures of core, CPI trim, CPI median, uh, those exclude the things that are going up the most and the things that are going down the most. So most of the shelter components are in the things that are going up the most. So they're excluded from those um, core measures. Um, those core measures are still running uh, over 3%, around between three and three and a half. And that's true on a 12 month basis and on a three month basis. So what's that telling you is that uh, yes, shelter is the biggest single contributor to inflation and it's certainly impacting Canadians. Um, but there are other underlying inflationary pressures uh, beyond shelter. And you know, we're, we're looking at everything together, and I think we've been quite clear, we're looking for further evidence of uh, sustained downward trend in underlying inflation. Let's go to the back now and Promit Mugerji from uh, Reuters News Agency, please. Good morning, Governor. This is Promit from Reuters. I uh, wanted to ask you that the federal uh, budget will not be tabled until after your uh, next policy decision. Uh, will you be comfortable lowering rates, uh, uh, if, you know, before you know the government spending plans? Uh, well, look, we'll, we'll take our April decision in April, uh, and um, you know, we'll we'll look at all the information we have. Um, Yes, we won't have the federal budget when we get to the next decision in April, but you know we have a, we have a decision every six or seven weeks, so uh, you know, we'll have it at the next one. Well, maintenant, uh, passons à uh, Olivier ferrand boisset du uh, Réseau TVA. Oui, et bonjour, uh, Olivier ferrand boisset TVA. Merci de prendre nos questions. Um, il y a un directeur parlementaire du budget qui a publié hier qui estime que uh, le taux d'inflation reviendra à la cible de 2 à la, à la fin de l'année. Et selon lui, selon cette prévision-là, pour commencer à avoir une baisse des taux à partir de uh, that out outlook, we're trying to see if there will be a drop in prices. Costs are more for the budget parliamentary uh, staff. We published our forecast in January, and as I underlined this morning, there's been no great surprise since January. We haven't updated this forecast, and as regards inflation, we estimate that it will remain close to 3% over the first half of the year. In the second half, we do anticipate inflation will uh, gradually ease and go down. In this forecast, we probably won't be at 2% at the end of the year. Our forecast in January uh, stated that that would occur in 2025. The message is that we have made progress and we are hoping to make even further progress, obviously. But the message in the short term is that this progress will be slow and inflation will go up and down 
there are these uh, shelter pressures, fluctuation in gasoline prices, and all of this will have an impact on inflation over the months to come. Let's now go to uh, Mark Rendell from the Globe and Mail, please. Hi there, Mark Rendell here. Thanks for taking the question. Um, in the past two months, the Bank of Canada relaunched its overnight repo operations, recommenced the receiver general auction. Um, does that suggest that the quantitative tightening program is nearing an end? And uh, could it be wound down earlier than previously signaled in late 24, early 25? Uh, well, let me make a couple comments on that one, Mark. Um, yeah, as you highlighted, um, Towards the end of the year and, and in January, uh, we did do a series of overnight uh, operation, overnight repo operations, lending typically about $5 billion uh, overnight. And we were doing that because the uh, overnight rate uh, was going, uh, was moving up, there was pre upward pressure, it was moving above the uh, targeted overnight rate. When we take monetary policy decisions like today, we decide on the target for the overnight rate. Uh, it's been 5% for some time now. And we were seeing in the market, there was some upward pressure. So we came in uh, to relieve that pressure. Um, we we did, did those overnight operations 13 times in January. We haven't done any since January. And that really reflects the fact that uh, that pressure has gone away. Um, as you mentioned, um, more recently, the government has also restarted uh, auction, receiver general auctions. That does provide some extra liquidity. Those are up and running. The uptake hasn't been uh, super strong. So again, uh, what that's suggesting is those pressures have gone away. So coming back to your question, um, we don't think QT was the root cause of these overnight pressures. Uh, and you shouldn't take this tightness that we saw in January uh, as a suggestion or as a sign that QT is likely to end earlier than we previously uh, expected. Do you want to say a few words about why we think that pressure was, we were seeing that pressure? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, our sense is uh, where that pressure was coming from was the, as sort of later in January, markets kind of settled into the view that uh, central banks were likely to cut rates soon, and that pushed the demand for long bonds up. Um, a lot of participants were um, purchasing those long bonds on leverage, so the demand for funding was up sharply for, for a stretch of time. So as the governor said, I, you know, it's not our read that that has a lot to do with our QT strategy. Our view on our, our QT strategy hasn't really changed significantly. We've We've said from the beginning that we're going to be transparent and predictable. So the bonds on our balance sheet are going to roll off as they mature. The maturity schedule is something you can see on our website. So far, QT has gone very smoothly. Our balance sheet is about 40% smaller than it was when we started QT. So we expect to continue as we planned. Certainly, um, if that changes, uh, you know, QT is something that we reflect on at every rate decision, and it shows up in our in our uh, press release, and, and, we, and the governor talks about it in his opening statement. So if, if our view changes, if our strategy is going to change, we'll, we'll definitely give advance notice of that. And um, just to do a little pre-advertising, our colleague Tony yeah. Gravel will be giving a speech uh, on our balance sheet management uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, he'll, he'll have a little more to say at that time. OK, let's uh, now turn to Raul from uh, Epoch Times, please. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I, I wanted to ask about uh, maximum sustainable employment, and uh, I believe it was last July that the uh, the bank published that that chart in the uh, in its uh, in the NPR. And, and so I want to ask um, how the bank is approaching trying to achieve uh, maximum sustainable employment while uh, fighting inflation, and and would pursuing uh, maximum sustainable employment more proactively suggest uh, cutting rates uh, sooner, based on how Presumably, those labor market indicators have 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 worsened um, since uh, July. Uh, a couple of things, Ro. First of all, um, our target is for two percent CPI inflation, um, and yes, 
we certainly do look at the labor market and, you know, in general, 2% inflation and, and achieving maximum sustainable employment uh, go together because if you're not at full employment, uh, you're, you know, you're, you don't have enough people working, you don't have enough incomes, uh, inflation's gonna fall below. If you're above it, the opposite happens. There's gonna be a lot of upward pressure uh, on wages and prices. Um, we were in a situation that the labor market was very overheated. Uh, you could see this across a whole range of measures. Uh, you know, labor supply, sh labor shortages were at very elevated levels. Um, the you know, wage growth uh, accelerated sharply. Um, if you looked at vacancies, they were uh, very low. Um, what we've seen is that those things you know, the labor market has come back into better balance. Vacancies, which, uh, sorry, vacancies were not low, they were very high. Uh, vacancies were very high. Uh, they have come down. They're actually now at more normal levels. Um, the unemployment rate, which was at you know, virtually an all-time historic low, has moved up. It's still relatively low. Wage growth, which had been running at 4 to 5%, um, has begun, uh, well, there's certainly some early signs that it is beginning to ease. Uh, that is something we're looking for uh, continued, some continued moderation so that wage growth comes more into line with productivity growth and, and our 2% inflation target. Um, so, I mean, if you look at the labor market indicators overall, uh, and we have, we have a detailed, um, page on our website, which provides a wide range of indicators. Can't really summarize the health of the labor market in one indicator. But if you look at them overall, what, what you see is the labor market's come in, 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 into uh, much better balance uh, and um, employment growth has slowed. It's been below the rate of population growth. That's been needed to allow supply to catch up. Uh, we've needed some time to let supply to catch up. That's brought the, the labor market in, into better balance. Um, and the second thing I'd say is that, you know, so far uh, we've brought inflation down a lot uh, without a recession, without a large increase in unemployment. Uh, the labor market adjustment has been, uh, it has been relatively gradual, relatively smooth, and we've moved from a very overheated market to a better balanced market. Uh, and, and our hope is that, you know, we can, we can continue to achieve um, uh, we, uh, further progress uh, on low inflation with, with, without causing uh, any major disruption to the economy. Go to uh, Jordan Gowling from CTV, please. Good morning. Um, you said there are upside risks to inflation that remain. Can you expand a little bit on what those risks are and which ones are you most worried about? Um, so there are clearly some global risks. Uh, you're seeing the attacks in the Red Sea. Uh, those are impacting global transportation costs. The Panama Canal doesn't have enough water, so traffic is very slow. Um, so far, so, so those, those things have increased transportation costs. So far, um, the effect has not been very large. Uh, and... There, there obviously, with the global conflicts we have, there are obviously um, risks that oil markets could get disrupted, oil prices could go sharply higher. Again, so far, um, that has not happened. Um, so, but I think the, certainly the risk is out there that uh, these things escalate. I uh, certainly hope that doesn't happen, but that could happen and that would have, Certainly higher energy prices, uh, higher transportation costs would feed quite quickly into higher inflation if that were to materialize. Domestically, um, th the risks really come down to the persistence or sometimes as economists we use this word stickiness of underlying inflation. Um, you know, we are seeing uh, a gradual easing in underlying inflationary pressures. Um, the risk is that that stalls and you don't get back to 2% inflation. And that's why we're really looking for continued 
or further and sustained evidence of uh, downward momentum. Uh, we don't want inflation to get stuck materially above our target. Let's go now to Randy from Bloomberg, please. Hi, Governor. You noted surprisingly strong growth in the U.S. How does a scenario of a no landing in the U.S. impact your decision? Um, well, I mean, the most direct effect is, you know, a stronger U.S. economy um, means that demand for Canadian exports uh, is stronger. We have been uh, surprised actually now really for the last couple of quarters in the strength of the U.S. economy. U.S. growth, just to be clear, it is slowing, uh, but uh, it, you know, the whole, the whole path has been higher than we and I think most people expected. Uh, and so other things equal that is probably creating stronger demand for Canadian exports. Um, you know, when you take the Canadian economy as a whole, though, uh, growth through the second part of last year was close to zero. Uh, and that, that has given uh, supply the opportunity to catch up with demand. We now think the Canadian economy is in uh, modest excess supply. And that is one of the things that is giving us more confidence that you know, rates are high enough and has shifted our discussion to not whether we need to raise them any further, but how long we need to hold them where they are. Okay, we've got three questions left here in the room. Uh, first, I'm going to call on Greg Quinn from Market News. Good morning. Um, some economists have, have felt that the bank's core inflation measures may have become a little bit uh, misleading. Are you satisfied with how they're, they're working out, or do you think there's a case to maybe in the short term think of a downside inflation scenario or come up with a, a new core measure of inflation? Um, Look, we, we are comfortable with our measure, our preferred measures of core inflation, but, but let me highlight a couple of things. First of all, um, we, you know, we've been using this term underlying inflation. And I think the reason we've been using that term is uh, underlying inflation reflects what we're seeing in a whole range of indicators. And, and so we're trying to make sure people don't get fixated on one number. Yes, our preferred measures uh, of core inflation are... Uh, important. They're very prominent. We put a lot of emphasis on them, and we've been very clear we're looking for further and sustained uh, easing in, in, in those measures of core inflation. But we also look at alternative measures of core inflation, uh, so-called exclusionary measures, CPIX food and energy, CPIX. Uh, we're also looking, and I think we mentioned it uh, in the press release, at the whole distribution of price changes. Uh, and one of the things we're seeing is that, you know, still about 45% of the CPI components are rising faster than 3%. When you're at 2% inflation, that number is usually 20 to 25%. So it's still about double um, what, what is normal. And coming back to Niju's question, you know, that is one of the indicators that there's, there's still some broad-based inflation. There is still some underlying inflation in the system. Um, so... When we talk about underlying inflation, we're looking at all those things. We're all also looking at the, the balance between demand and supply. We're looking at wage growth. We're looking at inflation expectations. We're looking at corporate pricing behavior. Um, and what we're looking for really is consistency across those indicators. We're going to become more confident that inflation is clearly on a downward track if those things are moving down and there's a high degree of consistency across them. So, I mean, coming back to, yes, you know, we, we need, do need to, to uh, we need to look at, you know, all the evidence we, uh, we have. Our core inflation measures are certainly prominent, uh, but we're looking at a broader range than simply those. Let's go to Paul Vieira from the Wall Street Journal now. 